recording. We will be recording today's session, just FYI for everyone. So if you do have to leave or have anyone else that you know who wants to join and isn't able to, we will have links uh, for the recording after the fact. So without further ado, today what we have is a really exciting panel discussion between four panelists who are all uh, working within the contemporary art world in Los Angeles and is presented by four of the ACAD schools in Southern California, which is CalArts, Otis Art Center, and LCAD. And uh, before we get too far into it, I do wanna take a moment to have all of the staff that's present today that has worked to put this amazing panel together, just do a quick introduction so you all know who's here and who's behind this event. Uh, we'll start with, with CalArts, just since I'm here speaking. My name is Jen Hitchings. I'm the director of the Center for Life and Work at CalArts, which is Career Services. And I will turn it over to, let's see, do we have Lonnie here? Yes, yeah, so um, I'm here. Hi, everyone. My name is Lonnie Wizadur. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm the assistant director for employer relations and industry connections. And I'm going to pass it over to Brent. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Brent Kuzik. I go by um, he, him, and I'm the bridge to industry coordinator at in the CLW at CalArts. Awesome. Thank you. And let's turn it over to Art Center. Awesome. I'll kick us off. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm Alicia Alex, um, she, her. I am the director in career and professional development at Art Center. Um, I'll pass it over to Roxanne. Hey everyone, I'm Roxanne Fenton, also she, her, and I am the Associate Director in Career and Professional Development at Art Center, and I'll pass it to Eilish. Good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Eilish Russell. I am the Career Advisor in the Center for Career and Professional Development at Art Center, and I will pass it to Shay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Shay Seymour. I'm the coordinator for Art Center Career and Professional Development. Um, and I'll introduce our new hire, Amy. Good morning. Uh, my name is Amy Gonzalez, and I am the Art Center's newest uh, career advisor. Thanks, Amy. Um, should we pass it to Otis? Sure. Hi, my name is Julia Bingham, Executive Director of Career Services at Otis College of Art and Design. I'll turn it over to Valerie. Hello, everyone. My name is Valerie. I am the Assistant Director of Career Education at Otis College. I will pass it over to Talon. Talon, maybe with a student. <laughs> OK. Next, we have, uh, is that everyone from Otis? OK, if it is, let's go to LCAD. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm Robin Fold, she, her, Director of Career Services. Awesome. All right. Thank you all so much again for joining this discussion. Um, for everyone in the audience, a couple housekeeping things. Just uh, feel free to keep yourself on mute. You can turn your cameras on, of course, if you'd like. And if you have questions throughout the discussion, feel free to put them in the chat or you can raise your hand. Chat is probably best as the panelists can keep an eye on that. And if it seems appropriate to kind of address those questions at the moment, we can do that. But we will leave time at the end to have an open discussion between everyone in the audience and the panelists. You can direct specific questions to each panelist or specific panelist or to everyone, totally up to you. So again, without further ado, we're excited to have this panel discussion ultimately Given the title from Art School to Art World, demystifying the gallery representation model is really meant to just illuminate all of the various aspects of the relationship between artists and gallerists. Of course, that's very broad. There's a lot of different things to consider. So we really want to touch on various elements of that and how each of the panelists have worked with their artists over time, how they find new artists, how that relationship unfolds and continues and grows and changes over time. So with that, I would like to have each panelist introduce yourself. If you don't mind just stating your name, pronouns, the name of your gallery space um, or your business and where it's located. And then when you opened and anything else you think is super pertinent to just explain what you do and where you're coming from for this conversation would be 
Awesome. So I'll just go through my screen and everyone's order here. Vanessa, would you mind starting? Yeah, definitely. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vanessa Indies. Um, I'm the co-owner and director of Good Mother Gallery. We have locations here in downtown LA, and then we have a location in Oakland, California, which we've had since 2014. So we're on 10 years now. Um, and we specialize specifically in showcasing the works of emerging artists. Amazing. Thank you so much. Next, can we have Jeannie introduce yourself? Oh, sorry, you're on mute, I believe. There we go. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. My name is Jeannie Denholm. My pronouns are she, her. And I am owner of SCAPE Gallery. SCAPE stands for Southern California Art Projects and Exhibitions. It's a little bit of a hybrid business in that it's... Um, exhibitions where uh, in a gallery format where we do coordinate um, solo and group exhibitions. Also just art projects is a big part of the business. I do a lot of things outside of the gallery, um, art advising, collection management, um, some out, offsite curating. Um, so I'm a, kind of, a, I consider myself a little bit of a hybrid gallery, um, art advising and exhibitions and um, I have been in business, the business started in 2003, so going on 21 years. Amazing, thank you. Next, can we have Neo? Hi everyone, um, my name is Neo Vardan. I am the owner of Vardan Gallery. Um, we opened our door in September of 2023. Um, I lead the business with, heart, with my heart um, and I'm learning along the way. Um, thank you, Jen, for giving me this opportunity to speak about the gallery. Awesome. Thank you so much, Neo. And Gerard. Hi, my name is Gerard O'Brien. He, him. Uh, I'm the owner of the Landing Gallery. Uh, I started this program in my decorative arts gallery reform uh, 10 years ago. And in 2015, we had our first exhibition here on Jefferson Boulevard in what's known as Jefferson Park, uh, mid-city location. We're a representative gallery, although we did start out working with a number of California historic estates, uh, and I'm happy to still represent three of those, but uh, most of the program is focused on contemporary and mid-career artists. At the moment, we have uh, uh, quite a um, esteemed member of the Otis family on our walls, as Roy Dowell show is our current show, which just opened this past Saturday. And I would encourage all of you to come down and have a look at uh, uh, Manchas Profundas, Deep Stains, which is uh, Roy's current exhibition. Very beautiful. Amazing. Thank you so much. And welcome all of you again. Thank you so much for participating in this discussion today. So first question we have, if each of you would like to answer this, I would love to hear everyone's perspective. Um, this is a question that we get a lot as uh, career services here at CalArts, at least. I'm wondering, how do you go about finding new artists to work with these days? What channels do you use, if any? How do you how do you do that process if it's a, for a group show or anything else that you're just looking for new artists? How do you go about that? And uh, Neo, yes, you can start. Um, I just completed uh, my first big group show with 100 artists. And um, I find it, Instagram was the biggest tool. And the community that I found myself within, I think it's very important for artists to find themselves in the community that they believe in. I think um, just like looking at um, the, you know, the certain artists that are following an artist is a good, it, it, it just makes me look at the work closer. And um, yeah, Instagram was the biggest tool. If you're right, if you use it the right way, you can find amazing talent on there. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Who would like to go next? I can go next. Uh, I can add on to that. Um... I feel like when uh, we started the gallery back in 2014, Instagram was still like a new thing, but it definitely has blown up into this kind of like great way that artists can use it as a portfolio. Um, so it's been pretty prominent in our search as well when we look for new artists for group shows. Um, we do use Artsy a lot as well, but Artsy is um, a platform that 
artists can only get on if they are working with a gallery that is showing on Artsy. Um, so if you do show in a gallery that has an Artsy platform, that is a great way to kind of get your artwork out there. Um, but other than that, I meet a lot of artists um, through them coming to our exhibitions every month. So a lot of artists come out, they show their support. Um, I always recommend artists to do that with galleries that they like, to just go out to the shows and show face, introduce themselves to the directors and the curators. Um, and then we also find a lot of artists through other artists. So artists will kind of uh, refer their friends to us or we'll go do studio visits on recommendations from other artists as well. Great, awesome, thank you. I'm happy to go next. Um, picking up where you left off, Vanessa, I think um, some of the, my, the artists I work with, a lot of it comes from referrals and that would be uh, referrals from colleagues, other people I know that are in the business, uh, definitely artist referrals and other gallerists um, would refer artists and clients refer artists to me. So I think um, mostly large part of the artists I work with are introductions through people I know in the business in one way or another. But I also attend a lot of art fairs. Um, I'm constantly looking at work, um, artsy and other um, methods. Um, I encourage artists to, and not everybody does as many mailings today as they used to, but um, you know, I remain on a lot of artist mailing lists, whether that's through email or snail mail. And sometimes it's following artists for years before you actually work with them, um, seeing their work and, you know, but following their careers. And um, I think that, I guess that covers it mostly. I think my gallery is is similar to everybody else's story. I will say that um, for us, traditionally, the way we start with new artists is a group show. Um, I like to think of my program as a family, honestly. Um, you know, I've only lost one artist in the entire time the landing has been open and um, I, I remain friends with her to this day. So uh, I think that uh, I think about it in terms of bringing somebody into the fold. And that takes time. Uh, and one of the things that's really uh, a catch-22 about having a representative program is that you really only have six slots a year if you're lucky. And, you know, those slots pretty quickly fill up with just the people in your family already. So there aren't many opportunities to be ambitious and to um, react uh, to the market, so to speak. Um, I, I will say also that for me, the fairs have been a really important part of it. I've been participating in Not of Miami for the past seven years, and I make a point of spending one day with myself and my director, whoever's with me, to really go out and look at the entire fair and then share notes on what has touched us or what we felt um, you know, has an impact for, you know, what our point of view is. Because I do think, uh, I'm sure the other gallerists will agree, um, what you want to look for in a gallery is an advocate, is somebody who's going to be um, attuned to the type of work that you're making and understand the sensibility of the work that you're making. So there's no point in sort of throwing your lot out at everybody. You really want to try to find the right place for you. And generally, you're going to know that by the work that's hanging in the walls of the space. Mm -hmm. For sure. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It sounds like there's a lot of common threads here. Referrals, um, looking through fairs, looking through Instagram, things like that, seeing what the mutual commonalities and um, mutual interests are, right? With what you're already doing and with what you, the artists that you're already working with are also doing. Um, so kind of on that note, is there... This is such a broad question, but what is seemingly the most important thing to consider for you when thinking about working with a new artist, maybe before you even do it, but if you see the work, you like the work, what is the most important thing to kind of draw from um, when you're reaching out to them for, let's say, a studio visit? Is it just the quality of the work? Is it their CV? Is it where they went to school? Does any of that matter? What What kind of things are most important to you? I mean, I'll, I can start with that. The person, person is the most important thing because relationship is everything in this world. Uh, relationships are bonds and you hope to have them 
for a long time. And so, you know, we all have made friends. You, you guys have all been in art school. So you have a community that you've built there. And really our galleries are just an extension of that community. Uh, we build a community within our gallery. Um, you know, I, I took the lead from very early on. I was lucky enough to curate a show at Blum and Poe Gallery. And it struck me when I went to Blum and Poe, anytime I went for an opening, there would be half of their roster in the room. You know, they all participated. They all were part of supporting the other members of their community. So for me, it always starts with the person. And you find out studio visits are so important because, you know, you're being invited into somebody else's environment. You're, you're basically going into their home, so to speak. And, you know, seeing how they host is a very good indication of what the relationship will be like going forward so you know don't um if you get that opportunity which is a golden one to have a, a gallerist or a curator come into your studio um that's really a very very important moment and you know knowing how you're going to navigate that moment and how you're going to present yourself is is very important awesome love that well, totally agree. I know that's a lot thing we talk a lot about is the relationship because as you said, it it is a relationship. It's not a one-way street. It's reciprocal. Um, yeah, they may not like me. <laughs> and that's a good thing to find out too. You know, I'm not for everybody. So um, you know, you have to find your people, so to speak. Yeah. Awesome. I, I personally I don't come from um, you know, art history background. I don't, I'm just uh, I'm just learning as I go, but doing a hundred person show was such a crash course for me and working with so many different artists. It was definitely, as you said, um, Gerard, it's just relationship based. Some artists feel entitled. They, they think that we are here to serve them, but in this position, I don't think neither one of us are serving each other. It's a relationship. It's, it's, um, you know, we have to meet, um, meet in the middle to make, make something beautiful happen. And, I had the experience of working with artists who are just humble and I want to continue giving them shows and then artists who were just complaining and being difficult that I don't want anything to do with. It's just any other relationship, whether it's a friendship, romantic relationship, it's just, this is a work relationship. Agreed. I would agree with that. I think um, it is definitely the whole um, success, I think, of people in the business, whether you're on the gallery side or the artist side, is that it is built on relationships. And, uh, but I would also say that I I do look at the work um, and the, um, for me, I am looking for someone who has a distinct style that they've developed. And um, I like work that if you look at that person's work, you would say, oh, that is, must be so-and-so's work just because it's a very distinct um, in terms of the, maybe the materials they're using and the work that they're making. Um, so when you look at a lot of art and you're sort of trying to um, think about what artists you're gonna work with, I think the quality of work is really important to me. And also just that there's a unique style, there's something unique happening with that artist and their relationship with their work. And um, I think that when you ask the question about whether is it important where they went to school, it's not so much for me important where they studied, but I think it is important. Um, I do acknowledge when they're, you know, um, have gone on and received their, M, you know, MF degrees. It does, it's not a make it or break it scenario but I think it's important because I think I have found artists that have gone on to study and um it with grad school that that is the place where some distinct styles and you know honing in on what their interests are and starting to make work for themselves and exploring so I do pay attention to that as well Yeah, I definitely agree with everybody as well. And somebody asked in the chat there, why do you continue to work with artists after you work with them? And it does definitely have to do with the personality um, and the work ethic of the artists in general. You know, um, we test out a lot of artists by doing group shows with them. And we do about five to six group shows a year. And then we'll do about five solo or duo exhibitions a year um, to kind of fill up the rest of the space. And after doing the group exhibitions, we can kind of have a 
um, you know, a feeling on who we're going to move forward with uh, in terms of if we're going to offer them a solo show or offer them to be in another group show down the line. It definitely, um, you know, having a good um, work ethic also goes into place, like getting your work in on time, showing the gallery that you're responsible um, and that you can complete things on deadline is also another big thing because I've uh, stopped working with certain artists because of that because they weren't able to get the work in on time or because they were unresponsive to emails. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. I think, I think another thing to bring up is we are looking for very confident people in their practice and in their point of view. So you have to have a really strong defined sense of yourself because we're not going to tell you what to paint. We're not going to tell you when we need it, you know, for X, Y, Z, you, you have to come ready for the opportunity. And that's super important. I mean, obviously all of you guys are pursuing graduate, you know, level studies by and large. So you're in this, you're not, you know, somebody else said, yes, I, I, I agree with this idea that I'm looking for artists who have a defined point of view that when I look at the work, it looks like them. I can't think of it being just sort of derivative of somebody else's practice. But moreover, I, I want this, I want to see a sense of self. I want to see somebody who I can see in five years will still be painting. They're not going to be selling insurance or, you know, uh, opening a bar. You know, this is their makers have to make, you know, and I look for that in the person. I have to see this sense of, hey, you know, I'm glad you're here looking at, at my work, but whether or not this is going to work with you, this is what I'm going to be doing and I'm going to do. And and gosh, I've I've had plenty of fantastic studio visits with artists that I really like, and I really like the work, but I just know it's not for me. But that has nothing to do with not, you know, not caring for that person or the kind of work they make. I just have a specific kind of, you know, purview or a point of view for how I see the gallery. Um, so, um, but, you know, the, the hardest thing is just to be ready for the opportunity. And, um, you know, it's all in the preparation and make sure that you're, you're, you're ready and you show us that, you know, that you're ready. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I feel I feel like when an artist is questioning themselves, if they don't don't sell a show and they start to think about doing something else, that's also a big no, no. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, like maybe one specific idea. You just, that I I think you just have to like uh, live and die making art for for me to want to invest in you for the long haul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess to that point. So we're I'm looking at several of these points about you know in a way professionalism of being an artist. We want to make sure that artists are dedicated, committed to what they're doing, motivated, but also like meeting deadlines, right, and doing things that kind of have to happen in order for the show to happen. Um, is there any other aspect of professionalism? Because that's a difficult word sometimes when artists are thinking of like, what does that mean? How am I supposed to present or look? Or what do I do to appear professional? What should I not do to, prepare, to appear unprofessional? Is there anything else that any of you feel like is really helpful to impart on the audience to what that term really means and what you're expecting as far as professionalism from your artists? Communication is a really important factor for that. Um, I think just good communication, returning phone calls, um, emails uh, in a timely way is important, um, especially if it's an exhibition that, you know, you've got, we're working with a timeline. Um, so I think, you know, we all need that kind of that courtesy. Um, and um, I think just being organized is, you know, go, falls under that professionalism category. Um, being organized, getting images, having the images, a big thing for me is having, um, reducing the amount of work that I have to do from my end. Um, so having those images titled, you know, with the title of the piece, the measurements of the piece, is those are time-saving elements for us on our side. Um, and not having to go back and request images more than once and, you know, just timeliness, um, communication and organization would be three big things on my list. To bounce off of that, I absolutely like love when, you know, whenever I message an artist to see 
what kind of work they have available. They have their PDF like ready to go and they have, you know, photos, just straight on photos about all of their pieces, all of the information, all in one place. Um, I really don't like when artists just send me cell phone photos of, oh, this is what's in my studio right now. Um, it's always way more professional to just whenever you finish a piece, take a photo of it, put it in one document so you have it all in one place. That way, whenever the opportunity does pop up, you can just send it right away. There isn't going to be any like scramble for, oh, let me make a PDF real quick or, oh, let me get to my studio and take photos of things. <clears throat> but well, yeah, that's definitely like the number one thing that I love when artists are on top of. But by the same token, I, I, I've had great experiences with artists where they're just honest and they tell you they're not ready or they don't want to show you work or, you know, you're going to have to wait. Like, I like it when you're in control, you, you know, that that that's fine by me, too. Um, uh, and, you know, I have the experience just this week of uh, an artist that I do very well with who's just opening a show in Florida and. I had advisors reach out to me who'd seen the pieces in Miami this past year and asking what else might be available. And I know there's a show about to open in Florida, but I still reach out to the artist and say, hey, you know, is there anything larger in the studio still? And, you know, in a half hour, I've got a PDF with three available works from his studio that I can offer, even though there's a show up, you know, a brand new 12 new paintings in Florida, you know, the who knows why or how the people are going to come to you. You know, you just, our job is to satisfy our clients who are asking for things. And, you know, oftentimes we've got to be able to rely on the artist and, and for sure being organized in your practice and having, um, you know, your materials ready is, is an advantage. I just I, saw, I, what, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, I saw a question come up from mm -hmm. somebody that wanted some detailed information of what a PDF should include. So I just thought maybe we should address that for them. Um, I and you guys chime in on this, but I think um, the PDF is should include a good image of the work that is well cropped. <laughs> Sometimes I get some, um, you know, images that haven't been cropped, um, meaning that it's just an image of the work of art. You don't necessarily want to see what else is in the studio behind it, or um, and then um, the title and the measurement of the work, the medium, and um, price point, if if that has been you know achieved with the artist. Does anybody else have anything else to add to that? Uh, I was just gonna say that professionalism for me is when I see an artist working, showing up and having the discipline to work in, the, um, in, their, in their studio and making the best work and telling the truth. Um, I, I'm not always looking for a profession. I think for me to see an artist working and just keep on working and doing what they do, not caring so much about what people think and having that confidence within their work, for me, that's professionalism and the rest, I, you know, I, the rest, I feel like it's my part to just sort of like guide their, uh, find them and guide them along the way as a gallerist. Awesome. Thank you. We have a, one other question in the chat a little bit of the ways up, and then we'll get a bit into pricing and selling. So there's a social media question. Um, do you all think that posting art on social media or Instagram takes away from the experience of viewing it in person? Does it ever hinder people from going to see the work in real life? Or is it beneficial enough for getting viewers excited about the work that you do want to be seeing work on online? I know a bunch of you mentioned you tend to find artists through Instagram. But maybe maybe talk about that dynamic a bit when you're working with an artist, for example, if you want to let like let them do what they do on Instagram, or do you have a little bit of a say in how they approach what they share, let's say before a show? Um, definitely, if I'm working one on one with artists for a show that's coming up, we do have a schedule for posting and we don't really want every single piece to be just like dumped out before a show opens. Um, but if the artist doesn't have anything other than that work, of course, there's ways to kind of post like sneak peeks of the images, studio shots to kind of like, you know, dangle the work and not necessarily just flat out post it all. Um, but yeah, usually every 
artists I work with is different. Some artists are very scheduled with their content posting and some are kind of loose with it. Um, for example, we have a solo exhibition coming up this Saturday with a local artist um, and us as the gallery shot all the photos and then we created like a schedule to kind of slowly post everything leading up to the show. Um, and then in terms of like, I mean, I don't know if you all agree with this, but in terms of artists in general posting on Instagram, I like to look at it as like, this is your portfolio. You should be posting your artworks. You should be posting studio shots just to get people interested in your work. Unfortunately, the internet is like the main way people get discovered nowadays. Um, I'm sure back in the day, it used to only be through studio visits and seeing the artwork in person, but now it's like the most prevalent form of finding new artists. So definitely having a strong online presence is going to, you know, help support your career um, and just get eyes on your piece. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be different for the, you know, the artists that you're working with. If, if it's somebody who doesn't have gallery representation anywhere else, they're certainly going to use Instagram and, and the internet is a much bigger tool for showing their work constantly. And they should, you should definitely, um, you know, you don't want to overdo it. Um, but you know, that is a place, but you know, once you're working with established artists who are already in other galleries and, you know, you're sharing an artist with other galleries, you have to be pretty careful about letting um, images out and bleeding images because, you know, you, you need to create some, you know, sense of at least there being urgency when a show does open. So you're holding back until that moment. Um, but, you know, it, it, the, the internet is not a panacea. You know, we can't roll it back to the time before. It is what it is. It's a tool. Everybody has to use it. But, you know, I hate it. I definitely think that, um, you know, there's there's something about my program. There's uh, one thing that people have often talked about, the artists that I show, is there's sort of a tactile quality to surface with a lot of the artists I show. And most of that is completely lost when you're looking at images digitally. An artist like Jonathan Ryan, who's literally using sand as a medium on his paintings, you know, people think that they're seeing a painting, but until you're standing in front of it and experiencing it, you're really not. And so I, I miss the days of having, uh, you know, more people in the space, in the physical space. Um, and I do think, you know, if I jump back to something else, for artists who don't have a gallery yet, um, I think going to the galleries, you know, sort of having your wish list of who you wish would show you and just being a presence in those spaces, that doesn't mean inundating those galleries with your, you know, with your material or asking them to look at work, just be there, just be there, be curious, have interesting questions. When you get the opportunity to be one-on-one -on -one with the gallerist, you know, ask an interesting question, you know, make your presence known. And and that's so much better than, you know, saying, who, who do I send something to? Or can I send you anything? You know, you just have to start swimming in the ocean where you want to swim. And it should definitely be where you want to swim. You don't want just anybody to be your advocate. You want the person, you know, who loves your work, who's ready to be your advocate. Absolutely. I think it's, I, I, I personally think it's best just to not overthink it, especially when you're just finishing school and, and just be true to yourself and, and not think too much. Just focus on your work. Focus on your work. And I'm, I think one of the most important thing is to surround yourself with artists that you admire, artists who inspire you. And you don't have to be good, close friends, but follow each other. Because that's one of the biggest things I look at. If some of my favorite artists that I admire are following you, I'm going to look at your work. And if I see it on a digital forum, I'm going to want to come to your video, come to your studio and see it in person. Obviously, I'm not going to do a show unless we see the work in person. Awesome. Thank you. Um, there's a few questions that get into selling, pricing, all that good stuff. So let's let's get into that a little bit. Um, the first question is, do artists who you work with have a network of their own collectors already? I work with a lot of mid-career artists, and so I think a number of them do have um, mailing lists and collector base. That's not necessarily um, a sole reason why I'm, why I'm working with them, but it um, does seem that because being in that mid-career 
area that there is that that comes with it in, in my case. What was the question? If, if you're working with an artist, do they kind of come with their own collector base? And how, I guess that's a deeper question here. How does that work for all of you? If you know that an artist you're working with probably has sold a fair amount of work, how do you approach that question with them? And then how much do they rely on you trying to sell work to your collectors? I, I have a show opening. Um, again, I'm a new gallery and I'm experiencing all of these. Currently, I have... Uh, I have a big show with Chantal Martin and we were on the New York times and the, the show didn't do that well. And she's, you know, mid-career artist. My following show is with a up and coming artist in New York, um, Logan Sebrel and the works the, the show's almost sold out and I didn't do much. He came with collectors. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's case to case. Yeah. I think also if you're working with artists who have other representative galleries, it becomes really important to schedule, you know, for the artists to schedule themselves based on, you know, what one, one of the hard, hardest things with an artist who becomes quote unquote hot is that they try to work too fast and they try to make work that's too fast. And, you know, most painting takes time or if sculpture or whatever medium, film, video, whatever you're doing, you know, you, you can't um, sacrifice your practice for um, commerce, dare I say, because if you get caught in that trap, then your minute can evaporate pretty quickly because, you know, eventually people will look at the work and they'll look at it closely and fast paintings are fast paintings. Um, and, you know, you really want to make sure, especially if you're working with multiple galleries, that you really think about a two year cycle of how you're going to, you know, how you're going to let work out and who's going to have it when and making sure that, you know, I don't have a solo show in Los Angeles two months after you just had one in New York, because, you know, we are all selling to the same clients. There isn't a, a wonderful group of L.A. collectors versus the great group of, you know, it's, it's the same people, you know, and, uh, you know, sadly, uh, you know, it, it's sort of like a blessing and a curse. If you're coming out of school right now, there's never been more opportunity for you to find a gallery because there are way too many fucking galleries, excuse my language, but there just are, it's absurd. And, um, so there's great opportunity, but, you know, that also brings its own set of challenges and, uh, you know, Well, having a lot of work available online, say, I, I always look at Artsy now. If if an artist has too many works on Artsy for sale, I'm probably not going to want to do a show with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's sort of, do you feel like that just is an indicator of uh, just too much work out? Maybe there's too much production and not enough demand. What do you think that is? I feel, like, I feel like produce as much as you want, but be cautious how much is out there. Because the reason I personally, and I learned this from the from the current show that I have, I was not aware. And this sort of like rang a bell that I, the, the current artist that I have on that's not selling well has over 100 pieces on Artsy that I was not aware of. Mm -hmm. And this also, now I'm looking at it, making sure that, you know, the artist that I want to, that I believe in, that I want to show the works, you know, there's not a lot of works out there for sale. You know, I, I, I'm a little bit jaded about those um, platforms because I had a decorative arts gallery before my art gallery. Again, my my program grew out of a decorative arts gallery. And, you know, I was lucky enough to be around for the beginning days of, of first dibs, you know, when the Internet was just changing. And, you know, the way it was in the beginning, you know, first dibs literally meant you had first dibs on what was going to be at the Paris flea market that weekend. It was first dibs. Uh, that's how Michael started it. And then he grew it city by city with about 15 of the best galleries in each city in the world. And so then it was incredible. First dibs was amazing. I likened it to being Bergdorf Goodman. And then overnight, internet company buys it and they scale. Let's scale up. So you go from having 20 dealers in LA to 250. And suddenly if you've sold a doily in the flea market, you're the same as me. We're all the same. And so I watched 
first dibs literally destroy the decorative arts business. And I don't think it's ever actually really recovered. So I'm not on Artsy. I was on Artsy for the first year the gallery was open, and then I got the fuck off that platform because I don't think it's helpful to anybody. I don't think it sells a lot. I think it's a, a company just trying to scale up and hope somebody will buy it, and I don't think they really care about any of their artists or galleries or any of it. It's just you know a big old marketplace. Um, I think the best thing to do is you know have your own website as an artist and as a gallery. And, you know, be be present and, and use all the other um, channels. But uh, I don't see Artsy as a great way to break an artist or build an artist's reputation or career. I just see it as a place where dead inventory is sitting around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as, as um, I think Vanessa mentioned, Artsy, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, artists do need to be represented by a gallery that or not represented. They have to have shows with the gallery that has an Artsy account in order for their work to be listed on the platform um, and it's it's market driven it's based on buying and selling artwork there is an editorial section but um, that's just something if anyone has not looked too much through the platform and it's a relatively new ish it hasn't been around for it super long um, but that's that's very helpful to hear everybody's perspective on that so maybe to talk a little more about prices and consignment um, so one question in the chat was does the gallery provide a consignment agreement or is that the artist's responsibility i I'm going to assume everyone says the gallery provides that to the artist. Um, you have your own terms that you have determined based on how you want to run your business. And that inclu is included on the consignment agreement. Um, one quick question I'm thinking, have you all had moments where you have to negotiate the terms of a consignment agreement because an artist asks for some changes? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Cool. Sure. I mean, for some artists... You know, uh, although this model has changed in the in the old days um, and for bigger programs, I, I, I don't want to suggest that anybody on this panel today isn't a big program. I don't think I'm a big program, but it used to be sort of de rigueur that we might cover production costs for artists or, you know, those sorts of things. So um, those can all factor in if you have a practice where you're making something and the materials to make your work are expensive and we believe in you, then, you know, perhaps uh, the, the, the split might change, you know, based on what your costs are. But, you know, sadly, the truth is when you're going to price work, how much labor you put into it, what the costs are, all these things really don't matter. Like some people take 10 minutes to make something and it's the most expensive thing on the marketplace and other people take a year to make a painting and it just doesn't factor in sadly to how much you can actually sell it for um price is such an arbitrary thing it really is it's it's really a feel thing um and usually with a new artist i don't really even like to look talk about pricing until i've hung a show and i see the work in the space and then I really get a sense of where I think things can be priced. I mean, if they're coming to you with a price, you know, already or an established price because they're selling with another gallery, that's one thing. But with with new artists, it it usually comes down to seeing the work in the room. And then, you know, I've looked at 10 years worth of work in this room and, and I know where things are priced and and I can figure out, you know, what where where this should be. Mm -hmm. Uh, on our end, we showcase a lot of emerging artists. So these are artists that have um, a very young career. You know, they've shown in a couple galleries. They're not necessarily represented yet. Maybe some of them are. Um, but in terms of pricing for emerging art, um, it's completely like, a, like on our end, it's kind of just like an experiment. If you've sold work before, of course, the gallery should upkeep that price that you've been selling work for. But if you haven't sold any work before, we usually recommend artists to price their work as reasonably as possible and so that they could grow a collector base. And then once a collector base is established, then we're able to discuss bumping up the prices slowly over time until, you know, you get to the point where you're making something that, um, you know, you feel like is worth your time um but the art game is like a long run game you got to start slow and kind of make your way up the ladder and not get too focused on the money part and just get focused on the oh i need my work to be out there it needs to be shown and like i want to grow a collector base i don't want to make my work 
$20,000 right out the door so that nobody can afford it just so that I can make $20,000. Um, it's not about that. Um, somebody you put a question about, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but somebody put a question in here, like what's the art dealer split? Um, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but in general, like regular gallery commission is 50-50. So 50% 50 goes to the artist, 50 goes to the gallery. Of course, there's instances, um, like Gerard said, where an artist needs a specific build out or needs something, um, you know, just needs a little bit more budget. Of course, uh, consignments are negotiable. We can like bump it in any direction, um, but it's dependent on each artist pretty much is the consignment agreement in general with good mother we have a consignment agreement for all group shows where we like hold on to the work from anywhere for six months to a year um, after the show is done to continue and try and push the work some galleries are different um, for solo shows we definitely hold on to the works that didn't sell for up to a year so that's always in our consignment agreements um, but yeah i hope i covered that question <laughs> And uh, let's see, other questions regarding payment, all of that. So we went over uh, contract terms. I guess we could we could talk a little bit about representation. This is, of course, a big part of this conversation. And everyone here has different relationships with what that really means. But for, for art students wondering, you know, what exactly does representation entail? I know there's, we could go very deep into this. Um, but if, a, if you as a gallerist do represent artists, and you want to assign a new person on for representation, what are the terms generally for you? Is it regional based on the city? So is it, you're saying, hey, I, I will represent you in Los Angeles. Um, is it the United States? Um, are they allowed to do group shows without your approval? Do you get percentages of all works that sell outside of your space, even if they sell um, in another group show? What are some things you wanna kind of share with the group based on what representation looks like for you? I can say it's that's an interesting question from um, my demographics, because I think LA is a really uh, big market for artists, and I'm not in LA. I'm south of LA. I'm in um, Corona del Mar, Newport Beach, that area. So for me, it's more. I I feel like I'm being unfair to an artist to restrict them from showing in LA. I think LA um, offers them something that I can't necessarily in terms of exposure. So for me, I, um, and again, I think that's, this goes back to that relationship thing. It's like, you know, you want to support each other. And so um, for me, most of the, um, I'm mostly concerned with Orange County as a sort of protected territory if I'm showing their work. Um, and then um, just trying to work together if there is a gallery in LA, you know, there's, there's a relationship there with the artist and perhaps another gallery in LA and how we work together. So in that instance, I I try to be realistic about what my clientele brings to the artist and I don't want it to be, by restricting it through a contract, I don't want to restrict their career. I, I don't work with contracts. Everything's a handshake in this business. If you don't want to be with me, then you should go. If you want to stay, you should stay. Um, definitely, if you want to be in a group show in Los Angeles, uh, we just consigned a good mother in in the fall, and uh, it was a great experience. But yeah, I tack on a, you know, it's it's been going up of late. It used to be pretty standard to put ten percent in there for us, but you know, when I've had group shows in the past year, I've had people consigned to me at with, with a 15% cut for the gallery consigning, sometimes 20%. It all depends on, you know, how hard the artist is and, you know, how in demand their work is. So, and, and pretty much we all, we all take it because we, you know, we want to show the work. So um, we're going to take it with whatever handcuffs come with it. Um, but for sure, you want to protect your artists. Uh, I mean, I think one of the things about this proliferation of New York galleries coming to Los Angeles, don't kid yourself, it's only about one thing. They're tired of sharing their artists with California galleries, and that's why they're here. They're here to open in, in California so that, you know, the next generation of young artists that they build, they won't have to share with a Los Angeles gallery. That's why the New York galleries are here. Um, and, you know, some galleries from LA are brave enough to uh, swim in the waters of Manhattan. 
uh, I wouldn't recommend it, but but some people are doing it. It doesn't seem to last very long for California galleries going there. But I have to say, I think the New York galleries will be in Los Angeles for a while, and I'm sure there'll be more of them to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. We've seen that, especially over the last, what, three, four years, it's been pretty wild. Um, and yeah, to your point, Gerard, that for anyone who isn't familiar with a lot of the regional kind of aspects of representation, an artist ideally would have in a lot of ways, a New York gallery, an LA gallery, maybe Berlin, maybe London, maybe some European city. And then all of the galleries work together to make sure the price points all the same. Um, everything's kind of agreed upon, but if, if they can't, you know, a lot of artists will not be able to have an LA and New York gallery if every gallery that they would work in has locations in both cities. So that makes things a little complicated now. Um, and I think that's a lot that's dictating a lot of artists having to choose in a way that they didn't have to before. So, um, okay. These, so are good, these are good problems because if, if, if you're dealing with one of those galleries, that's, that's, you're in a good place. You're swimming in a good place. That is true. <laughs> that is true. If, they, if there's enough funding around for having two locations in the two most expensive cities in the United States, that's, that's good. <laughs> Um, so contracts, I know we went into a little bit, um, that's an interesting point, especially Gerard, that you, for you, you're much more relaxed with uh, those types of agreements and to go into what we were saying before, the relationships pieces. We, we have contracts, we have consignments, so it's not like there isn't any paperwork and we're not held to any kind of covenant or tenant. Um, there's a duration for how long I'll have the work. It's spelled out who's going to be taken care of, um, you know, generally... I take uh, all the freight on board. If an artist is in California, it's much easier. But if I'm working with a New York artist or a Chicago artist or wherever, I'm I'm going to have to incur the costs of shipping to bring the work to me. And then I'm going to have to incur the costs of shipping to return the work if I don't sell it. So, you know, that that part of it, it is, is a contract. But in terms of, you know, holding you, you know, making you beholden to being with the gallery, uh, you know, it's only as long as 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 the consignment contract is 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 extant. And with the people I represent, you know, at this point, I, I have artists. Uh, I just had a, a you know one of my very who I would consider one of my core artists um, ask me for a bunch of work back, and and it took me a little bit by surprise. But you know, I just took a phone call and talking to her to understand what her thinking was, and you know, now I'm gonna be shipping a bunch of paintings back to New York uh, in, in a month. And it, it makes sense. You know, I'm, I understand the reason that, that she needs the work. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. And in the, yeah, in the chat. So yeah, I think for a lot of artists, a lot of times getting into this is like, we kind of all just understand what is typical, right. At some point. And it should, it could be outlined in a contract. Um, it should always be in a consignment in theory. Everyone should have consignment agreements just for in general but when it comes to more specific representation, I think just converse, a lot of times it's a conversation, right? Between you and the artist and there's some kind of a verbal agreement. Maybe it is in writing. I think that if you want to just summarize as an artist, if you're not sure if there's going to be paperwork, just emailing the person afterwards and saying, just to confirm, we clarified this. this. So I, I mean, in truth, the email is a contract, you know, it, it you know, documenting, like, for example, if somebody, if you have a conversation with the gallerist and you're not happy about it or it feels uncomfortable or something is said that you're not comfortable with, you should document that in an email and exchange it with that gallerist so that that exchange is there. And then, God forbid, something does happen where it gets litigious at some point. That is all you need. You know, you you just need the conversation to be documented. So, um, you know, be, be smart. But um, uh Again, that goes back to the original thing I said, which is I'm always looking to build a family and I'm looking to work with people that I have a good relationship with. So um, I think if you go into it looking for the problems, then, but, you know, you'll find them, you know, you, you want to go into it, you know, hoping you're, 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 you're going into this good relationship where everybody's, you know, rowing in the same direction, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I think. I was just going to add, I think that that, um, just to repeat that, I think the contract part really is more a consignment sheet from my side too. And then the rest is really just conversation 
and um, a mutual respect for each other. And then I think following that up by email, you know, from the artist part or something is enough because I don't have contracts that are signed either. I also just wanted to add in about representation in general. Um, I feel like artists are very quick to thinking that representation is something that needs to happen right away with a gallery. And it is something that you build upon with a gallery that you already have a relationship with, I feel. Um, all of the artists that we represent, we've been showing for many years and we decided to then represent them because we do have more of a personal relationship with them. They are more like family. We both understand each other. And then it is one of those like handshake agreements. Um, I always, not warn, but if an if a gallery approaches you as an artist and you've never shown with them ever and they want to represent you out the door, just be weary because, you know, you don't know them. They don't know you. Again, it goes back to the personality and, you know, the personal relationships that you have. You don't want to get into a contract with somebody you don't know and you haven't worked with before. Um, so I always recommend that to artists, at least show in a couple group shows with somebody before you accept any kind of representation. I think if a gallery cares about you, they'll encourage you to show and they can guide you where to show and where not to show. But I am experiencing meeting a lot of other galleries from different parts of the world. And the artists that I've shown and I believe in, I encourage those galleries to look at their work and show them in other places. So I don't think there should be any sort of ownership. It's a relationship thing. Trust. And the bouncing off of that, sorry. Um the artist's career is only going to expand and get bigger if they show at other galleries. So if a gallery is just holding on to one artist and not letting them show anywhere, that artist isn't going to grow in any way because that gallery has a specific collector base and a specific reach. So being able to show in different places allows for the artist to grow, um, which is great. That's a good thing. Like that's what other galleries should want. They should want their artists to have a bigger reach. There's an interesting question in the chat too, uh, a little bit earlier. Do installation and video artists, so let's say not 2D, to, not painting necessarily, but other types of work, you could add performance in there. Are they also collected or is it more an exhibition thing? I think this is a conversation that could go on forever, right? But um, as far as work that isn't, let's say painting, drawing, even sculpture, sculpture is even difficult sometimes, but work that is not necessarily going to be acquired and live on someone's wall. Um, how do you all kind of navigate that with your artists? It depends, of course, on what types of work you've shown before. But um, I, from my perspective, yes, everything can sell. I mean, we've all seen those crazy examples of really ethereal conceptual works being sold. I mean, solo wit pieces, uh, Catalan, all of these pieces that end up usually in institutions. Um, rather than personal collections. But does anyone have any else, anything else they want to kind of weigh in on that subject, um, you know, less traditional media? Um, I've had a lot of experience showing vi uh, video art and performance art at the gallery. Um, and it depends is pretty much my answer. Um, we've shown video art that was like specifically made on VHSs that then the artists, you know, we could then sell those VHSs and, you know, there was only five of them made and that's it. Um, if it's a video that's just on a loop in the gallery, um, we've had artists make sculptural work or pieces in tandem with the video that then those sculptures or pieces could be sold um, kind of like as part of the video. Um, but yeah, it depends on every situation. Performance art, you know, you can't really sell it. <laughs> so if the artist does make something that um, is tangible along with the performance piece, that's kind of an easier way to to be able to, you know, make the work available for people to buy. Um, but yeah, it depends. It depends on what kind of video art you're making, what kind of performance art you're making um, and what's included in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that if you're making that kind of work, you're gonna gravitate towards a gallery that has experience in working with artists that show that kind of work. I don't think that, Every gallerist has the um, capacity to undertake showing challenging media. Um, you know, you, you have to have a pretty strong stomach for that kind of work. 
and a good sense that you have the collector base or the client base that will respond to that kind of work. So um, that's in no way meaning, you know, put yourself in a box and only show what you think is sellable. You got to make what your voice is and, you know, hope that it's going to find its audience. But there tends to be galleries that are more ready to, you know, undertake that kind of, you know, that kind of media. I, I would add to that too, that um, I think that there's other venues uh, beyond galleries that maybe there might be stipends paid for that kind of work. The The income that comes with that type of work may come from um, other sources, artists and residents, um, like you said, institutional. Um, so there's, there's other support systems, I think, financially that support financially for that type of work. And, and it might be through grants also. That's actually leads me to a question real quick to kind of divert, but in your um, in your roles as gallerists, and I like the term advocates, honestly, um, do you also help your artists do things like write and submit grants, um, obtain other opportunities that are outside of the, the market per se? I certainly have had a lot of conversations with my artists about residency programs and which ones they should be looking into. Um, because I think those are invaluable. Uh, I think that one, they're, they do, it, it, it's it's a shame to say that you're resume building, but you are. So to, to be accepted into a residency program is a competitive environment, just like it is to get into the program you're in currently. So those kinds of things, showing that you're actively engaging that still, that even though you're finished with school, you're still looking to build on your practice and go have experiences um, so I think residencies are are important, and I certainly have had a lot of conversations uh, with my artists around that. Um, uh, grant writing, not so much. I mean, certainly if there was somebody who was taking on an ambitious, um, you know, project where they needed the funding to to do something, I could see grant writing coming into it. But that pretty much tends to come from the artist. It, it doesn't so much come from the gallerist unless. Uh, the gallery has a big enough team to have, you know, a director liaison that specializes in that kind of thing. Um, my gallery doesn't have that. Great. Yeah, I think grant writing, from my experience, usually doesn't necessarily come from the gallery side, although um, we can help steer that. Maybe we might not. I mean, I know a few people that do write grants. Um, and that's, um, I think, letters of recommendation. And that's the part that we come in and and can help with. Great. Um, there's another question in the chat. So it's a little bit about where what happens to the work after it's sold. Um, so let's say you do sell work to a client of yours, or whether it's existing or new client of yours, where does it go? So in theory, I'll, I'll kind of start with, usually it would go to their home, hopefully hanging somewhere in, pub, in, in public, you know, in public space, um, unless you're selling to an institution, then it'll go into a collection. Uh, we, I think most of us know sometimes work goes into storage. Sometimes people have enormous collections and there might be a rotation of how they display the work in their home. Uh, but does anyone else have anything they want to add to where work lives after it, it gets sold? And we could also talk about auctions because that's another question. Um, we, it's a mix of things and every gallery is different. Some galleries sell, you know, direct to clients. Some galleries specialize in selling to businesses, to institutions. Um, you know, some galleries um, have better relationships with museums. So they're able to get your artwork acquired by museums. Some galleries don't have that. Um, we've sold to a wide range of different kinds of collectors we sell to a lot of businesses as well that you know they'll put your stuff in storage for a few months and then i'll you know switch it out so that their offices can change throughout the year um we sell to restaurants uh we sell to private clients um it's a pretty big mix we sell to other artists <laughs> we sell to other gallerists yeah I will say that it's not that you need necessarily to do this, but I'm sure my colleagues would agree that 
I like nothing more than an artist who really thinks about how their work should travel. I love an artist who makes their own travel slipcases, not because it saves me an expense or I might not have to spend the money. It's just that you've really thought about how your work should be handled, that you're not just waiting for other people to think about how your work should be handled. So if you come to the table prepared with with how your work should be handled, that's another, you know, high, high uh, mark for you when you're when you're meeting a gallerist that you've thought about these things, that these works aren't just, you know, in a vacuum in your studio, that they're going to leave your world, they're going to go someplace else. And then if they sell, they're going to go someplace else again. And so thinking about, you know, how they're going to travel is it's a really I think that can give you a big leg up for, um, you know, your hunt for a gallery if you show people that this is something that you've thought about. I would be um, add to that, too. And just um, traveling is one aspect, but just how it comes, how you deliver it to the gallery and how you bring it. I think um, we observe how you handle your work and we tend to handle the work in a similar way. I mean, I always try to handle the art really professionally, but I know artists that are meticulous and, you know, um, really thoughtful about how the, that work comes to the gallery. I'm going to take more conscious care myself of that work, seeing how they are handling their work. Does that make sense to everybody? Are you the same? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I've had a, my first gallery that I ran in New York. I mean, I was 22, but someone walked down the street with a painting, just not wrapped or anything. Yeah. And it's just stuff like that. But even at the time, I was like, OK, that to your point, this this shows me how you look at the work and how you want me to treat it, which. Right. That's right. And it's just that I mean, unconsciously, I always want to take uh, good care of artwork. But I think when you see how the artist is taking care of it, it does somehow subliminally make you pay more attention or less attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, someone did ask about auctions here. So can anyone weigh in on what their your thoughts are? Um, I know we can, again, talk about the secondary market for an eternity. Um, and we probably don't want to talk too much about it right now. But essentially, for anyone who isn't aware, auctions are just when someone has bought a work in their collection and they choose to sell it through an auction house they can sign it to an auction house and it goes up to be bid on by the public who wants to maybe buy the work um, how do you all as gallerists if you do come across this manage any of that with the artists that you work with if they have a work that goes up for auction um i can um my consignment um paperwork um states that if the buyer wants to resell the work to reach out to me first. Awesome. Love that. Not everyone does that. <laughs> That's great. I mean, I mean, good collectors do, um, you know, and you're basically your experience tells you, you know, the we all know where the works went. So when something shows up at auction, you know, who's putting it up uh, and, you know, pretty much if it's something that happens within a year or two of having been purchased, you know, that client's probably not going to get access to material. And that goes, you know, much further up the food chain than my size gallery. But basically, you know, you're committing a social suicide on some level if you put something up for auction too soon, because you're basically just going to have the valve shut off to, you know, that kind of material from that level of gallery. Um, you know, I think that probably all the galleries presently are we're probably not dealing with this problem as much as some bigger galleries are, but but it can happen. Um, but the truth is, once you sell a work, it's not yours anymore. It's theirs. And if they choose to stick it in storage, that's fine. And, you know, we all think the panacea is selling to institutions. But basically, if you sell to an institution, you are putting it in storage because um, very few things are shown in institutions. So um, it's a nice thing to have on the resume, but it's not necessarily going to be a great way for people to see your work, to have it going in, into an institution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a question too, and I'm, I'm glad this was brought up. Um, so for an artist who has a work that is sold, let's say through a gallery and the gallery or advisor, whoever it is, does not tell them where it went. How how do you all deal with this? Do you share the collector information with the artists? What do you share? What don't you share? How can you how do you handle that? I share I share that with the artist who bought the piece and where it which city it's in. 
a hundred percent it's your right as the maker of the work to know who's buying it and where it is that's that's like standard practice if, if a gallery doesn't want to share with you who they're selling to then i would i would think about ending that relationship pretty quickly yeah it's fishy yeah. i would um i have no problem sharing the client's name and the city in which um the art is staying but i do think that there's cases where if i'm working with an art advisor or sometimes a designer, I don't always know. I don't get that information from them. So I can give them the name of the art advisor and the designer you know, that acquired the work through me. But in some cases, we don't actually know where, you know, um, where it goes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it's usually it's pretty straightforward. Like we have the client's information. We'll like give the name and the city they're in. But of course, whenever a art consultant or some kind of middleman buys the piece, you, you kind of don't know where it's going to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, we are getting close on time. So I did want to make sure we got through most of the questions, I believe. Uh, I was kind of curious, which is a kind of, you know, basic question of these sorts of panels is there any anything that you have experienced especially with new artists right out of school that you want to impart on this audience to try to avoid doing so something that is either just a bad practice or maybe an assumption of how the gallery system works any sort of stories that you can kind of share with the audience about what they should be thinking about coming out of school. And we talked a bit about what's to be expected. Um, we're entering, you know, the market, you want to grow with your galleries, you want to grow with collectors, you want to grow with writers, but is there anything else that you all want to share? Um, just thinking about, you know, new grads and what they should be thinking of and being careful to navigate. Well, one thing I saw in the questions that I that I think is smart, you know, I, I, my my gallery certainly says on our site that we don't take submissions. So don't submit to a gallery that says they don't take submissions because they mean what they're saying. So that's already going to kind of be a knock against you. But on the other hand, you, you're saying if you come into our world and you're you're trying to have conversations because of the medium of Instagram, you know, we're all human beings. We look at who posts about our shows. So if you come to a show, post about it. And most likely the gallery is going to look at the person who posted. And if they do that, they're probably going to take the two seconds to click on your profile. And you're probably going to have in, you know, the first two or three pages of your um, Instagram page, a, a, pre, a piece of your work. So we're going to get to know, we're going to get to know what your work looks like because you responded to the work you saw in our gallery. And then to that end about Instagram, I would recommend that you try to have your Instagram page as an artist be reflective of your practice. And that maybe it makes sense to have a personal page that has the pictures of your cat or your dog or what you did last weekend, you know, and maybe just keep the art, the art and your life, your life. I think that that's the other thing I would recommend about that platform. Mm -hmm. One of the things, love... oh, go ahead. Yeah, you I was go just going to say, I would love to add on that. Thank you. Um, in terms of reaching out to galleries, I always urge artists to really research the galleries that you want to reach out to and make sure that your artwork fits kind of their style. Um, every gallery is like any other retail store. You know, they have their own specific style and their own specific um, curation and they're not going to be able to show everything. For an example, um, at Good Mother Gallery, we don't really show photography, and that's just a choice of ours because we've tried to show photography and it's just something that our clientele doesn't necessarily gravitate towards. Um, but there are plenty of galleries that specialize in photography. So definitely doing the research and seeing what galleries um, are already showcasing before you reach out to them and send them your website, your Instagram, your PDF of works, that kind of, that's going to help um, because we do get spammed with a lot of <laughs> random artwork uh, throughout the weeks where it's like, if an artist just takes the time to really research and see like, okay, I would be a good fit for this gallery. Let me reach out to them. The gallery is going to appreciate that a lot more. Awesome. I was just gonna add a couple scenarios. Um, 
I think that walking in a submission is one thing. Um, and to Gerard's point, if it says, you know, we're not accepting submissions, don't submit. But I think a pet peeve of mine is when artists walk in without an appointment and introduce themselves as artists and have something in their car that could I take a few minutes and look at. Um, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know that artists understand that happens, can happen a lot. And um, it's hard. I mean, you can't, it's just rude to be asked, like, can you stop what you're doing and look at the art that, you know, I have a couple pieces or can I show you some work? So I would say appointments, if, you know, if they are um, open to submissions, that it's really important that you sort of work courtesy of by appointment or discussion. Um, one of the things I would say that um, selling direct out of your studio can be uh, a, you know, a backfire on you a lot. It's hard for galleries when they have relationships. We can't fault the clients. A lot of times the clients, and certainly because of social media, it's really easy for clients um, to work directly with the art or try to. And I think so I would I encourage artists to, if you've got gallery representation, if somebody's reaching out to you directly to qualify, how did they find you? Where do they live? And you're going to score huge points with your gallery and building that relationship if you have them work through the gallery, not through your studio. Um, and then the only other thing I would say when you talked about like it, um, do's and don'ts, I've had a few artists really shoot themselves in the foot when like in a um, I had an instance where there was a group exhibition and I had a client who was seriously interested in the piece that was on the wall. And, but the artist was there, was at the reception and he started talking to the client and he says, oh, I've got five more from this series at my studio. And it took the conversation a whole nother direction. All of a sudden their attention came off of that particular piece on the wall. And then the client felt like, oh, we should see what else is at the studio. And then it's over the internet you know, it's through image, it's not in person. And anyway, long story short, they, we lost a sale. So I would be really careful about those, you know, don't take the focus away or in another direction um, from what's happening inside the gallery with that particular exhibition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other do's, don'ts for new? new uh... I, I, I think that the most important thing is to befriend artist who you truly believe in and who inspire you to make your own work just befriend them go to their show openings mm -hmm. and you'll find the right gallery for yourself because those galleries are representing those artists and they're also following those artists and they're seeing what those artists are who they're hanging out with and who who they, who they support mm -hmm. or or your teachers for that matter you know i think uh you know this weekend I think I had Larry Pittman introduce me to three artists who he said, I have to look at their work. I mean, if Larry Pittman's telling me I need to look at three artists work, I probably should at least respect him enough to take the time to look. It doesn't mean any of them will be people I work with, but you know, that kind of a referral um, coming from your teacher, your mentor, uh, your, yeah. I think, I think the word that we're all circling around continually is community. You know, you are, you're entering into a community of artists. Uh, we reside in a community of gallerists. Um, there's a lot of fraternal um, uh, machinations that happen between gallerists. Uh, I, it was one of the things I found the most fascinating about opening an art gallery in Los Angeles. Um, was just how welcoming the community of other galleries was, um, you know, and to this day, I'm I'm always astounded by when I ask even the biggest galleries you could think of for something, how responsive they are. I mean, I'm so lucky that L.A. Louvre's warehouse just happens to be next door to me. And I can tell you, Peter Goulds is one of the best people I've ever met in the world. And he's incredibly generous with his time, with his knowledge. All I have to do is ask and Peter will do anything. And, uh, you know, that's an invaluable resource. Um, and, you, you know, your community is everything. Uh, uh, your fellow artists and those teachers and mentors, um, they're going to pay play a big role in, in all the things that are going to happen for you going forward. So, you know, keep those relationships good. Keep those bonds. Mm -hmm. 
for sure. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of ways everyone here is in school or was in school. So you already have a network that's built in. If you're, if you're in a major city, even if you're not, but if you're in wherever you are, there's going to be other artists, there's going to be other creatives and people that you can reach out to. We have Instagram now. It is a th thousand times easier to make connections with people all across the world than it was 20 years ago. Um, it's e easier to find artists. It's e easier to find gallerists. Granted, as you said, Gerard, there's so much of everything now. It becomes kind of intense, but there's ways to navigate it and finding your people, finding your community is really, really instrumental. Um, paying it forward, giving back, helping each other out is so incredibly important and just being involved, even if it's from just a support stance. And also I want to make the distinction between touching a gallery with an unsolicited submission and telling a gallery that you're in a group show or telling a gallery that you're in an MFA show. Those are all fair game. Like let people know what you're doing. You know, let me know where I could go see your work hanging on somebody else's wall, even if it's in L.A., if it's a group show at Good Mother and you're interested in showing with me, you should let me know that your work's going to be on the wall. I can go look at it in a, in a show or that, you know, these things are happening for you. Those are all good ways to touch. You know, I, I feel like that's my responsibility. Um, you know, we didn't get into a lot about selling, but I actually uh, I have a very strange philosophy, even though I've been selling things for 20 plus years, I don't sell. I, I actually believe that the pieces find their client and I have to be able to facilitate that transaction happening. That's what my job is. I, I'm not really going to sell your work. The work sells itself. You have to get it in front of the right people and then you make the transaction happen. And, you know, that that's the whole thing. And, it, you know, when it gets good, it, it, it happens a lot. Um, and, you know, we're all... Uh, uh, we're all swimming in the same marketplace. So, you know, when the market's good, it can be good for everybody. When the market's tight, which, you know, I think any honest person would tell you it's a tight market at the moment, uh, you know, things are things are different. But, um, you know, the, the, the sale happens when the person wants it. You know, the best time to sell something is when somebody wants to buy it. And that's usually when you find out how much something is, too, because prices actually don't mean anything. Uh, you know, works transact at the price they transact at when the transaction takes place. And, uh, you know, you'd be surprised how many times it's nowhere near the price that you think, uh, you know, when, when, when the, when the price was on the wall. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. The gallerist as facilitator and advocate is kind of what I'm grabbing onto. I think that's incredibly important for everyone to remember. Um, and this it is market driven in a sense that we are all in a commercial world in some way, but the role of the gallerist is much, much, much deeper than just facilitating sales even. Um, so thank you all again so much for getting to time. So thank you all so very much for participating. Thank you all for attending this amazing talk today. I know we could go on part two, part three, maybe we will, we will see. <laughs> So thank you all. We will send the recording of the panel to all of the attendees after the afterwards. So look out for that. And so, yeah, final thank you to Vanessa, Jeannie, Gerard, and Neo, and everyone who attended today. Thank you, thank guys. you guys. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks for Thank you. Thank you.